Hi everyone, I'm Kalki Kekla and I can't believe it, we have reached the 10th episode of Kalki Presents My Indian Life, brought to you by the BBC World Service. Thank you to those of you who've spent the last 10 weeks listening to us. Thank you so much, I hope you've enjoyed it. I have had an amazing time as a presenter. Now, what did you like about us and what didn't you like about us? Tell us, but don't troll us. Let us know, send us your messages on social media and emails. And I know I keep saying this again and again, but I'm going to say it one more time. Please do share this podcast with everyone else. I know it's coming to an end for you, but for some people, they're hearing the stories for the first time. So please do spread the word. And this is the video version, but you can also find the audio version by downloading an audio streaming app or a podcast app and looking for My Indian Life. Let's listen to episode 10. Not many people know that in a mostly tropical country like ours, there exists a sport like ice hockey. It's really an irony that you are representing a country where people don't know about you, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but if this kid Angmo has her way, it's not going to remain like that for long. I really want the whole country to know as cricket is known, as ice hockey should be also known. So I really want to be that one, you know, the one who wants to impact it. This is My Indian Life from the BBC World Service, the podcast about being young and Indian in the 21st century. I'm Kalki Kekla, and I'm bringing you some really incredible stories from all over the country. This is episode 10, India on Ice. Thank you so much for being with us through all the episodes so far. We've got two more to go in this first season of My Indian Life. I've really enjoyed reading your messages on social media. Find us on the BBC World Service page on Facebook and at BBC World Service on Twitter. The hashtag is My Indian Life. Our email for your own stories of being young and Indian in the 21st century is myindianlife at bbc.com. We may use your stories in future episodes. When we think about our climate, most of us think hot and humid summers, the annual heat wave, monsoons and mild winters. For someone like me living in Mumbai, the icy region of Ladakh in northern India feels like a whole other world. Ladakh is an arid desert with jagged Himalayan peaks, bone-chilling winds and spectacular lakes. In winter, temperatures drop to minus 20 degrees Celsius. The lakes freeze, and the children in Ladakh pick up their skates and sticks and play ice hockey. This episode is about adrenaline, teamwork, and a fight for recognition for a sport not many in India even know exists. It's about the thrill of playing and winning even in the harshest conditions. We hardly make any excuse when we are on ice. <laughs> even if it snows, we do play. We don't care. <laughs> 22-year-old Diskit Angmo plays for India's national women's ice hockey team. She was born in Leh, the capital of Ladakh. When Diskit was growing up, her father, a police officer, used to encourage her and her brother to get out of the house and play outside, even when it was freezing. Uh, we had this uh, winters, like harsh winters, so we had three months of break in school times. So my father was one of the members of Ladakh Winter Sports Club Leh. He was the one who, you know, like pushed us to go to the skating, like early morning at six o'clock, me and my brother. I literally used to cry, you know, like cry. And then, you know, still you used to like do up my laces and then he'd be like, go, go, go play. And then I'm like crying. My eyes are like, I have tears in my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> On winter mornings, this kid would reluctantly step outside. But once she started playing, she was a natural on the ice. She dabbled in figure skating and speed skating, using borrowed skates and practicing on frozen lakes. During that time, some of the boys in Ladakh started playing ice hockey, and soon enough, the girls wanted to play too. This kid, who was 15 years old then, said she didn't imagine a girl could play ice hockey too, but she was determined to try. The girls didn't have any equipment of their own, so they came up with a plan. We used to 
borrow the uh, every like equipments from the men's team you know especially the juniors you know who are like uh, <laughs> equal to us you know like the shoe size and everything they they were like very big but then we used to we used to like no no we'll manage it you know everything should like would be long you know even the pelvic cards and you know we used to use it you know we don't know the meaning but then still we used to use it like okay they are wearing it we should also wear it you know, no matter what <laughs> The lack of proper equipment was just one of their many problems. They also had to figure out where to practice. The only Olympic-sized ice rink in India is in Dehradun, 900 kilometers away from Leh, and it had been closed since 2012. So the girls worked out a way around this too. They made their own rink by pouring thousands of liters of water on a frozen lake. We collected the water in tanks, you know, from the water tankers, and uh, we selected a small place. Uh, we used to put water like several times at uh, around like three o'clock uh, in the morning, you know, mm. so that the ice would be frozen at that time. And then we'll again pour the water at the same t like after a few hours, mm. so that it will pile up. We used to sit in cars, like you know, just hang out, like chilling, you know, <laughs> uh, singing songs, and and, and then after one hour, it'll be like, okay, now let's go out and, <laughs> and pour the water. Pour. Yeah. <laughs> For every practice session, they went through all this trouble. But the natural rink was only good for one use, so the whole process had to be repeated each time. Sounds exhausting, doesn't it? Ice hockey is a fast-paced and intense game, and the women players faced many challenges. It's really hard, you know, sometimes you're on period and, you know, you are, like, really moody and then, you know, sometimes you uh, get injuries at small things like you know if you are just walking you get cramps you know mm. cramps and that's very difficult and the uh, winters the harshness of it does mm, that yeah you? sometimes i mean you don't have an indoor rink you don't yeah. have all the you know those luxuries uh, yeah <laughs> do you play when it's when the weather is uh, rough yeah we do play because you know we what we think is that we have only that period of time so we hardly make any excuse when we are on ice <laughs> <laughs> but it happens, you know, even if it snows, we do play. We don't care. <laughs> You're just glad to be able to Yeah, play. you have only this time, so you don't have to miss it. <laughs> right. And I never miss a chance of it. <laughs> That's how the women played ice hockey, through chilling winds and snow, using borrowed equipment and on a frozen lake. In reality, they only got around 40 days in which to practice in any one year. But when they had more players, they entered local tournaments. Playing in a team was fun, and Diskit found it easier to motivate herself to train and play. Two years ago, Diskit got a chance to play her first international tournament, the Challenge Cup of Asia 2016 in Taipei. The Ice Hockey Association in India raised money through crowdfunding, and the team got new equipment. For the first time in her life, she had her own shiny new skates. Not enough ice, yeah, in Bombay. <laughs> 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 this kid is pretty possessive of her gear, but she lets me try it out. Yeah, it's longer already. <laughs> so I put my left hand, if I'm already. Yeah. Like Even that? though the tournament in Taipei was a big opportunity, the selection process wasn't competitive at all. There weren't many women playing ice hockey, and the Ice Hockey Association struggled to put together a national team of 20 women. Some players didn't have passports yet. Some had exams at school, and others said their parents weren't willing to send them as Taipei was too far. This kid begged them to come, and they eventually managed to put a team together. It was the first time many of them stepped on an Olympic-sized ice hockey rink. The rink was like so huge and they were like, what is it? How are we going to play on it? You know, I, am I going to scream when I'll t tell you to pass? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and we were actually doing that, you know, when we were, uh, uh, we went to, for the first practice, you know, they were like screaming it, hey, pass it to me. Like, <laughs> it would be so difficult, you know, <laughs> just to yeah. do it. And then <clears throat> dice was like so f I mean, it was like tiles, you know, like we are playing on tiles, smooth. smooth and, you know, we were like, uh, how to manage it? This kid usually comes across as quite calm and composed, but when she's on the rink, she's a different person. Her competitive streak comes out. At the tournament in Taipei, she decided to play rough. It was the second match with Singapore, I guess. Uh, I'm a defender, so I was at the back. They were attacking on us, and I 
what my intention was like really bad. I was like, I'm going to throw that girl, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. I'm going to bash her to the boats and then, you know, I, she won't be able to get it. <laughs> and what happened was like, she just sneaked in and then I, I slipped. And then my shoes, it got banged with the boats. I tried to get up, but then I couldn't get up. I was like, something is wrong with this leg. And then I'm like, okay, okay. And then when I started, like, literally I stood up, I couldn't stand it. I just fall off. Mm. And then it was really bad. <laughs> and then they just took me to hospital and mm, it was a fracture. Was it, it was a fracture. <laughs> yeah. In your ankle? Or your... Yeah, in my ankle. Uh-huh. And then the doctor was like, you can play ice hockey. You can't play. Yeah, he told me. He literally, yeah, he literally told me that. And I was oh like God. crying like hell. You couldn't say that to me. How dare you say that to me? She was crushed. She couldn't play the rest of the matches in Taipei. The team didn't manage to secure any wins. Once back in India, this kid saw doctors, underwent physiotherapy, and took some time off to recover. To her immense relief, the doctors told her she could play again, but her mother was still worried. My mom was like, okay, good. now you stop. <laughs> this is too much now. <laughs> Don't do anything. And then I'm like, mom, you just wait for one year, <laughs> then I'm going to show you something. So um, I really motivate her by showing her videos, you know, where people are really beaten up in ice hockey for <laughs> you know, they get blood <laughs> That's <sheds. motivation>. yeah <laughs> and then she'd be like like seriously it happens i'm like this is nothing more this is nothing like it's like a small injury you know you see these people are like dying for it you know and then she'd be like okay fine i mean <laughs> you can play on <laughs> next year in 2017 the team again entered the challenge cup of asia which was being held in bangkok the team was determined to prove themselves this time. With the help of some crowdfunding, they took a trip to Kyrgyzstan before the tournament to train at an Olympic-sized rink there for a few weeks. That was all the training they had. In Bangkok, they managed to win two matches, one against Philippines and the other against Malaysia. It was their first international win, and they were ecstatic. In the moments before their first win, Harjinder Jindi, the secretary of India's Ice Hockey Association gave them a pep talk. Remember Shah Rukh Khan's locker room speech to the national women's field hockey team in the movie Chakde India? This kid said it reminded her of that. The last words that Shah Rukh Khan says, you know, during the interval. And so it was exactly the same, you know, the score was 3-3. And uh, the general secretary, this uh, Harjinder Jindi, we, we all were in the restroom and we were like really focused. And then he just came in and then he was like, you know what, do or die. (laughs) He just said that. And then everyone was like, oh, now we have to do it. So, and then we went back and then we just scored it. And this was the first international match. So it was really good. Huge, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) This kid's only regret after their victory was that she couldn't share it with her father. He had died suddenly of a heart attack when she was 18. She says she didn't let his death affect her passion for the game. His memory continues to inspire her. Whatever I do, whatever steps I take in my life, I always think that, you know, I ha- I have to do it for him, you know, not for me, but also for him. Whatever I am today, it's all because of my father, you know. I really, you know, motivate myself thinking about him, you know, imagining him, the, like, pushing me, like, when I was a kid. This kid now lives in Delhi, where temperatures regularly hit the mid-40s in the summer. I used to call my mom and then I can't stay here, you know, I want to come back. Even now, in summers, I can't handle it and I go back to lay. It's the monsoons. Temperatures have dropped a bit and this kid is back in Delhi from her escape to Ladakh. The team's first win helped to raise awareness about the sport, but not enough. When this kid meets new people, Many of them are clueless about ice hockey and confuse it with skiing. And there still isn't enough funding for an Olympic-sized rink to practice on. So sometimes they practice at a smaller ice rink in Gurgaon near Delhi. During one of these sessions, Biscuit and her teammates Sonam Angmo and Semzez Dolma are sitting on the benches, putting their gear on and getting ready to step on the rink. And this is my first ice skate that I've gotten. So it's been three years that I have gotten these new shoes. 
and it's amazing i really like it and this is the only one which i uh, which broke my leg for the first time also <laughs> this is the neck cut it's like a choker but not exactly <laughs> most of the injuries happens when you are not wearing a, a neck guard and it you know it hits the, the blades get hit with your neck and then no time to go up to the heaven <laughs> or to hell <laughs> so we are ready and we go and break some ice <laughs> after putting on their helmets they grab their sticks and hockey pucks and step on the ice their jerseys are emblazoned with their names at the back. After doing some warm-up passes, they set up a goalpost on one end and take turns to skate past a set of bright orange training cones and shoot pucks into it. Hajinder Jindi is watching the women play. He describes the difficulty faced by the players. This is one third the size of the international rink. Being small, you can't uh, practice over here and then go for uh, international matches. At best, you can improve your skill set over here. That's it. So, for winning matches, you need to be practicing on the full-size ring. Harjinder estimates that building an Olympic-size ring would cost more than 100 million rupees, or 10 crores. That's a lot of money. And there are additional costs. You can't expect funding only for the ring. You need uh, funding to recruit uh, and train uh, youngsters. Once they get recruited, say, at the age of uh, 8 or 10, then next 8 years is to groom them to become the best players. Then obviously you have uh, coaching staff. We, are, we have a very limited number of coaches in India. But Harjinder is optimistic. He thinks they can win an international tournament and that could play a big role in securing more funding. He talks about their first international win in Bangkok last year. They fought hard. It was an emotional moment for self also, but uh, it was a <laughs> great feeling at that point. The women step off the rink and take their helmets off. They chat about what's changed in the past five or six years that they have been playing ice hockey. Earlier when we, like, there were, like, problems when girls used to play, you know, like, I mean, they would be mock us in a way, like, very badly, you know. When usually when we had, a, uh, like, our team we were playing, the girls' tournament is going on, they would uh, mock us by singing songs, like, you know, the, the, it, there's a Ladakhi song, actually, so it's like, the, um, at that point of time, also, there was one uh, lady, like, one, one of our team members, she was a mother. So they used to be like mock us, like, oh, see, the mother is also playing, the mothers are playing, and stuff like that. They would chant, you know, like, so, yeah, it hurts a lot, but then we don't, like, audience, audience, we can't say anything to them, you know, they are mocking is always there, so we don't say anything. But then now I think it has improved a lot, like, the people are changing, and then they are really supportive, you know, like, the locals are very supportive. They'll come and they'll cheer you up when we have a local match or something. Now they say their practice sessions are more like picnics. They sing and dance, go for long drives, and have a good time. They sing one of the Ladakhi songs they sing back home. So basically the song is about uh, childhood memories. As they wrap up, they say they are pleased with their practice session. So, so tired, but still so good. Ah, it's so fun. I'm feeling like so thrilling right now. It's uh, amazing. I'm so happy. I'm so glad after so long I had to play. I, and now again, it worries me that, you know, I have to wait till winters <laughs> for two months, but it's okay. I feel fresh now. <laughs> yeah. When this kid is on the ice, she forgets all her troubles. Ice hockey gives her a good trip, she says. She is focusing on using her passion for the sport to raise awareness about it. When she goes back to Ladakh in winter, 
She travels to remote villages and joins training camps for girls as young as 12 or 13, interested in the sport. Her friends call her the Virat Kohli of ice hockey, and she won't stop playing until the sport becomes big in India. Ice hockey is us, she says, and if we leave it, it will melt away. This kid is determined not just to keep the ice frozen, but to make it a cool sport in India. So you have just heard the 10th episode of My Indian Life from the BBC World Service. I can't believe it. We're already 10 down. But do not fret. It is not the end of the first season yet. Like I mentioned previously, I've got something really special and exciting coming up in the next two episodes that we've recorded in front of live audiences of students. Here's a flavor of what's to come. In my head, I'm not different at all. I'm as normal as like you all or anybody in this world. It's actually, it sounds really serious, but it's funny. That's the story of my life. I would really like Ishan to do a little warm up. Up and down. <laughs> and down. So what does it feel like firstly to listen to yourself on a podcast? I was like, is that really me? How can I say all this? <laughs> I let myself cry. I was crying, but I was not sad. And the next day it was like headlines, headlines, headlines. And I was terrified. That's all he had to say. No, yeah, changing the world. Fabulous. First time I saw Naked Lady. Very good. <laughs> we would love you to sing a song. And say you want to Yeah. Dil ki lal sa. Hai ek sawal sa. I hope that you don't pass out uh, in the next hour. I hope you can survive. Trust me, if I can come out of this typical Muslim Orthodox house wearing a set of bangles, mm -hmm. anything can happen in this world, guys. Okay, Mumbai, let's hear you. That was a taste of My Indian Life live. Do look out for the full episodes. Also, if you haven't already heard all 10 episodes so far, please do go back, listen to them, and send in your comments and stories. I really want to hear your own stories of being young and Indian. Who knows, your story might end up being in season two? Our email address is myindianlife at bbc.com or find us at BBC World Service on social media. Our hashtag is myindianlife. And thanks to all of you who've already written to us. I'd like to share one of the stories we've received. I am a gay male, which no one knows until now, and I don't think I have the courage to come out, especially to my family. But I think it's a very good start to open up to someone whom we don't know or meet. So here I go. I am gay, and I am not ashamed of anything about myself. Just need to gather some more strength to open up to the people around me. And here's a message we've received after our last episode on Dr. Watsa, the legendary 94-year-old sex expert. Kanchana wrote, It's so crucial to talk about sex education. I think sex education should be at least discussed. But guess what? Teachers don't even teach it. I studied biology in class 12, but I am embarrassed to say that I didn't quite understand how it all works until I was 19 and in grad school. Thanks to all of you for sharing your stories with us. Please do keep writing to us, and if your friends, families, or colleagues haven't heard our podcast yet, please do tell them about us. Thanks for listening. <laughs>